What is up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And on The Stack, we talk about a couple of books that came out this week. And We let's... sure do. Yeah, we do. That is the yeah. thing that we do on this podcast, yeah. is we talk about books, but not just any books, comic books. Books yeah. that have words, ah. books that have pictures, but they aren't picture books. They're graphic novels in a monthly <laughs> periodical format. What is I think I snuck a I think I snuck a regular book in this stack. Uh, Let's just see if we get to it. Okay. okay. All right. Wait, was that that I, War and Peace one? Is that y- yes, 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 uh, yes, that yes, was yes. Very. That was a long comic. Yeah, but really good stuff. Yeah, good stuff. Um, All right, let's kick it off with a wild project I'm very excited to talk to you guys about. All-America Comics, number one, written by Joe Casey and art by Dustin Wynn. Now, this project has had a... Yes, Pete. How how is this legal? How is this legal? How is this comic available to be coming out? Is it the fact that it's digitally and they just snuck it in that nobody's... They're hoping no, nobody's going to notice. It's, it's coming out uh, physically <laughs> in stores as well. Uh, this is so Joe Casey is one of the co-creators of America Chavez, also known as Miss America or the reboot of Miss America that later ended up in the Young Avengers in Marvel Comics. Uh, eventually, she was spun off into her own series that ran about 12 issues. However, Joe Casey created her. People were like, this character is amazing. We love her release a series and Marvel was like, great silence. And so for years, people got more and more frustrated that they were not picking up on Miss America in any way. So Joe Casey essentially in, I believe uh, 2014 or something like that said, I'm just going to make my own Miss America book and I'm going to call it all America comics. And it's going to include America Vasquez instead and so he essentially has been working on this for, I may have my dates wrong, but I believe six years at this point, just getting this ready. Since then, there has been a, a Miss America book that was released called America uh, that people liked quite a bit. She's popped up in other books since then. Uh, but finally, this is coming out. That doesn't really answer the question of legally how they could do this at all, but to me, it might be the same way that Marvel could do Hyperion and the Squadron Supreme, even though that's Superman and the Justice League. It's changed just enough that it's OK. Yeah, Maybe I mean, it's, okay. it's not like he's in there's any sort of legal jeopardy here. This is like something that's been vetted and it's something that's coming out. And I will say, yeah, I- but. Uh, uh, Captain America's in this Iron Man. She fights doom at the end. I mean, what the f- but if you see they're, they're different enough that it, it is not the copywritten imagery. Okay. And given the fact that America Chavez, Vasquez, whatever you want to call her, uh, deals in multiverses and Joe Casey, uh, without spoiling too much of the book, is really, I think, very clearly like delving into the format of comic books and what it means to be read as a comic book character which was baked into America's character to, to begin with. Like she was, she was already, she wasn't like ambush bug or anything, but she was always kind of breaking the fourth wall in a certain way. Um, and that's what he's playing with here. That's why I think he gets away with it because you're not, I, he's not, he's not hiding the fact that it's the Marvel universe. Essentially. It's just going for something bigger and different. I, I appreciate her handle, though. She puts the real America just because, you know, I've had fake people try to claim my name, uh, mm-hmm. you know, so I had to I had to get on Twitter with the real Pete LePage. Uh, so nice I plan. understand that's I understand that that kind of like, you know, somebody tries to be, you know, somebody else, you know, and you're like, whoa, 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 in no way. So you're saying you really feel for this character because of a Twitter handle thing you had. No, I, I feel for this character because some guy who claims to be named fucking Pete LePage, who I've met, uh, you know, and uh, is clearly some kind of evil entity, you know, is trying to fucking, you know, steal my name. You met him? Yeah. He's dead I even now. tried to get him to come on. <laughs> I tried to get him to come on Comic Book Club. Oh, I man. remember Did you that. do a time cop? <laughs> no. Or was it a no. looper situation? 
Uh, yeah. Was he like you, but like significantly older or significantly younger? <laughs> no, no, it was weird. Yeah, he doesn't look he doesn't look anything like me. But he pointed out that I was the evil one because I had facial hair, which uh, then really made me hate him. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, that all said, this book is very good. Dustin Wynn's art yes. is always fantastic. Uh, Joe Casey's writing is always fantastic, despite the weirdness of its origins. If you like Miss America, you're going to like this book, and I don't know why you wouldn't like Miss America. Uh, it takes a second to hook into you just because of that weirdness and that disconnect, but the places that he's going with the story are so smart and so great. I can't wait to read more. Yeah, I agree. Like I didn't really talk about the book. Uh, it's really smartly done, and it's I think it's a perfect character to push a story like this where it is like – existing in the Marvel universe in a sneaky way, but because of, like you said, Alex, pushing through the different realities, I think uh, this book is allowed to make these comments on both of the, on both corporate comics and uh, this character and pushing her sort of through the story that uh, Joe Casey wants. I love, I love a lot of Joe Casey's work because it, it gets wild fast. It's very creative. Yeah, this is great. Definitely pick it up. Uh, next one, slightly more conventional Marvel comics, but still twisting things a little bit. Star number five, written by Kelly Compton and art by Javier Pina with Alipe Andrade. So this is a character we've talked about, I think, almost every issue of this book, and this is the last one for the moment. Uh, This is a character who got the reality stone embedded in her fought Captain Marvel and has a decision to make. Is she going to be a hero? Is she going to be a villain? What is she going to be now that she has this power? And we finally get an answer to that at the end of the issue. How do you feel this series wrapped up? I thought this was great. I really liked the story. I liked the art. And it's hard to put a, write a character that you really do position between uh, doing good and doing evil without it feeling like, ah, I, I see where this is going. And I think this this series does a great job of doing that. Yeah, I really agree with that. Like, this is a very original kind of take on something we've seen a lot, uh, you know, struggling with power, you know, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? But each issue is very surprising and it's very kind of unique. Uh, it It's very cr- over the top, which is very cool. Um, uh, also kind of changes art styles at different points and really well. Uh, yeah, it's it's an impressive comic, and I think they did a really good job with this book. I'm very excited to see what happens after this. You often see a hero introduced this way, where somebody decided, hey, this is a new, unique hero that we're going to introduce into the Marvel Universe or the DC Universe. They got a launch series like this. Maybe it hits, maybe it doesn't. And then they pop up a bunch of places because people really like the concept, even though it didn't sell well. You don't see it as often with a villain. I feel like the last time, and there's probably been time since, but the last time I could think about that was this successful was The Hood by Brian K. Vaughn, where this is the promise that she's going to pop up in books all over. And I really hope she does because it's such a good character that Kelly Thompson did such a good job of tying so deeply into Marvel universe continuity to want to back some off to Captain Marvel to the black order that it would be a shame if she didn't show up again. Kelly Thompson is a beast, man. She, her writing is really fantastic. I have yet to read one of her stuff and not like it. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, next one to talk about from Image Comics, The Goddamned, The Virgin Brides, number one, written by Jason Aaron and art by R.M. Guerra. Now, if you didn't read the first Goddamn series, this is set during biblical times, but it is uber violent, uber sexual, uber like take the Bible and make it the grittiest, most disgusting ground level thing you possibly can. The first series had, if I remember correctly, it was Cain fighting against Noah right before the flood. And uh, picking this up, uh, first of all, I didn't know anything about the concept of the book. Second of all, I had honestly completely forgotten about the series. We talked about this book. I love this book. But I had forgotten it existed. And even though it is so hard to read, 
just because it gets so brutal, I'm so glad it's back. Yeah, you love this, though. This is like creepy, pervy kind of stuff that you're really into. Yeah, yeah. That's my kind of like thing. That's like my yep. wheelhouse. So like, yeah, yeah it's real cool. The yeah. Bible was the original erotic fiction. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Begat? Um, so much begat. Just say it one more time. Just say uh, begat one more time. Talk about a triggering word. Whew. Um, yeah, I like this book a lot as well. I actually think this series is set up to be better than the first one. The first one felt a little purposefully gratuitous, and this feels like there's a little bit more of a premise and narrative drive to the characters uh, sort of making the choice they're making. Um, it involves a, a sacrifice of a, a virgin to this god, a seeming god yeah. up here, and it's it was wild to see the scene where the girl gets sort of pulled up into the heavens and you don't usually see that what happens that next moment. And the fact that they went for it here, I thought was really smart. Pete, you usually feel very uncomfortable with this stuff. What did you think about this? Yeah, this is not good Uh, (laughs) for you. Yeah, whatever. Jason Aaron is amazing writer. The art's unbelievable, but this is just way too fucking creepy. And I don't need this in my life right now. There's too much shit going on. (laughs) I don't need to know about this fucking cult that sends girls to get raped or whatever the fuck is happening. Fuck this. Well, I've got some good news and some bad news for you. The good news uh, is that your friends, Justin and uh, Alex are going to be very happy because the bad news is it's coming out daily. There's new issues coming out. I believe every hour on the hour Mm. uh, of this book. And we're going to review every one. Great. Live. As right. we read them and then talk about them, so that's very exciting. No, I, this is this is supposed to be brutal to read. It's supposed to be like I don't even know if it's a realistic version of the Bible, but it's what if we took these myths and stripped everything away about them that makes them these beautiful things that we want to aspire to, and instead applied it to the fact that most people lived in dirt and sticks and mud and were hungry all the time, had no resources, and were constantly dying very young, what then? What would happen? And that's what we get here. Uh, I don't know. There must be a specific story that he's riffing off of. This might be a New Testament thing because I'm not 100% familiar, Mm. Uh, but it's certainly like, like Pete was getting at, it's a group of women who are living in a land that is not destroyed. And as we saw in the first series, series, most of the land has been destroyed and been taken over. But in order for it to stay good, ostensibly the young virgins are uh, married to angels, except that's not exactly what's happening. Yeah. Um, this We've talked so about this for a while, creepy. but I, I think this is great. This is a great book. Uh, it is hard to read, but again, purposely hard to read. Yeah, I agree. Uh, all right, let's move, move on. 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 M- let's move on and talk about the goddamn The Virgin Brides number two from Image <laughs> Comics written by Jason. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I can sell you a body number four from IDW written by Wright and Ryan Ferrier, art and colors by George uh, Cambadias. Uh, so we talked about, I think, the first issue of this. It yes. started out being about a medium who could talk to ghosts. He kind of solved mysteries. He was a little bit of a detective story. Uh, and it all comes to an end in this issue. How do you feel the series wrapped up? Well, first off, it's a very kind of creative, fun idea. You know, it's uh, the art's fantastic. It's it's weird in all the right places. Uh, it, it's a, it's an easy read just because of all the action and all the things and the stuff where you're like, wait, what? Uh, but yeah, I, I like this just on the what the fuck is happening moments that kind of keep this thing kind of moving forward. Um, yeah, I, I, I like this. I think it ends nicely uh, in a cool way. Um, and I'm, uh, yeah, I hope there's more of it. I, I really, I think this is like creative and weird enough in such a cool way. And the art brings it to life, uh, that it's enjoyable. Yeah. I think we talked about it as like taking a premise and sort of a, giving us a little bit of a turn on it. And then I think over the course of the series, it just got kept turning and turning and twisting it in different ways. And we get to this sort of like epic confrontation but there's so much uh, going on with 
all of the characters that we've seen here, and uh, it's violent in a Pete way, but also wordy yeah. in a, a Justin and Alex way. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Thanks for breaking it down that way. Yeah, that was really it. good. <laughs> Next one is talk about Ravencroft number five from Marvel Comics, written by Frank Thierry and art by uh, Angel Anzueta. Yeah. So a bunch of monsters have taken over Ravencroft. The only ones who can stop them are a werewolf, the Punisher, and Misty Knight. Pete, this book was written for you? Yeah, yeah. It's nice to see Frank uh, back on Big Pun. And uh, <laughs> this is just... <laughs> Uh, you know, it's just fun. You want to see people killing werewolf monsters, and, you know, it's, it's a feel-good story. Does Frank Thierry call you and say, hey, Pete, what should I write next? <laughs> well, that's the thing. He's like, hey, Pete, what do you fucking think of this idea? I was like, I'd like it better if there was werewolf monsters. He's like, done. <laughs> I do love, I feel like Jordan White came on our show, uh, editor at Marvel Comics, came on our show Jordan and told D. you this. White. Jordan D. White, and mentioned that, like, every Frank Thierry story, once you meet Frank Thierry, sounds like it's Frank Thierry, which is not necessarily yeah. a bad thing. But no, since you said it. that, it's every Frank Thierry book is just like, I picture it. We've had Frank on the show, and we've interviewed yeah. him a couple of times. But every single thing is exactly what you're saying, where it's just like, uh, yeah, what if there's, like, a bunch of fucking monsters and Ravencroft <laughs> and, like, the Punisher fucking blasted to pieces and Misty Knight has, like, I don't know, fucking Wolverine claws or whatever. And then, like, uh, Norman Osborn's there, and he's fucking pulling the strings. And then there's a bunch of assholes who are pulling his strings. The end. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I got to say the at the last or the second to last page where he, the Janus breakdown. What a laundry list of wild character choices. <laughs> He's got G, G.W. Bridge, the X-Force and, villain from the late 90s. Yes, oh, yeah. James McDonald Hudson, which stopped me for a second being like, uh, is he evil? I He's barely evil remember now. that. He's evil now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's. It's just a mishmash of a bunch of fun, ridiculous elements all thrown together. And then, you know, the knoll, you know, don't forget that's a fun thing at the end. I want to say real quick, uh, the reason I know James Hudson is evil is this random Alpha Flight book that we reviewed was three standalone stories. And the last, the, the, the first one, or the last one was him trying to like reconnect with his wife. And it was this elaborate lie. Do you guys remember this? We talked oh, about I it. I do remember that. That was a good story. Such a good story. And I was like, ah, oh, it really like pushed like the evil side so hard. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So this is fun. This is a ridiculous mini series. I hope he gets to do more of them. Uh, it is. If you like Frank Thierry, I think you're going to like this one as well. Yeah. The Boys, Dear Becky, number two from Dynamite Comics, written by Garth Edison, illustrated by Russ Braun. This is simultaneously taking place after the Boys series, as well as before the Boys series, uh, as Huey and Annie, though we haven't seen her yet, are yes. hanging out in his parents' town in Scotland. Uh, while back in time, he is reading Butcher's Diary from the time when they used to work with Mallory. In this issue, the older version of the boys is going up against some soups that we haven't seen before. Uh, what do you think about this one? Uh, it's I think it's it's such a good device for telling stories um, here where they're giving us a sequel, but it's sort of a, a prequel, a secret prequel. So I'm very curious. I'm much more curious in the sequel side of it, like what's going on with Huey and why haven't we seen Starlight? Um, and the, the prequel stuff is just fun. It feels very much like here's a boy story I didn't end up writing. I'm doing it now. Yeah. I have, yeah, a, I have a theory about Starlight that I'll throw out at you. Please. Okay. Uh, I think she's pregnant. I think that's why we're not seeing her. Is like Huey is going back home. He's trying to reconnect yeah, cool. with his roots. And he is completely frozen because he has this future that is rapidly approaching where they're going to have a baby together. Is it going to be a super baby? Is it going to be a normal baby? What is that going to mean for them going forward? Uh, so instead, he's looking to the past and something that is more comfortable and easy to try to embrace that. Oh, interesting. Great theory. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, I think this was uh, fun. It's nice to kind of uh, revisit, you know, something that uh, is so well known. And I think they do a good job of kind of like adding enough new stuff to really make it feel new and then give us, uh, you know, a little taste of the old thing that we know and love. So I think they did a great job of walking the line in this comic. 
I guess I would say let's hear it for the boys. Oh, there we go. Uh, we have a podcast called that? Huh. Weird. That is weird. We do have a pod, boys podcast called Let's Hear It For The Boys. You should subscribe to it. Backtrack number four from Odie Press, written and created by Brian Jones, illustrated by Jack Elphick. Uh, man, I know I went off on this series with the last issue. I you sure did. But I think the concept is so smart and so yeah. good, and it plays through again in this issue. If you haven't picked up before, it's basically like a cannonball run style race, but through time. Yes. yes, the pitch, which is so easy and so smart, but it plays off like Lost meets all of those things. It has epic, tragic things happening with characters. They just escaped an ancient Chinese earthquake. Uh, and now in this issue, they find themselves in Berlin in the 70s on the wrong side of the Berlin Wall. It's tense. The characters are good. It's creative. It's such a good sci-fi story. Man, I really love this book a lot. I agree completely. I think it's so smart and so interesting. Um, uh, I, I wish this was the movie Speed Racer. Instead of that, I <laughs> oh, wish this wow. was it. Oh, wow. Speed Racer's good. Yeah, I've heard you say that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is very interesting. It's a lot of fun. Um, you love cars. I love cars, you know, so this is just, uh, this is a a good, it's just uh, crazy, but it's like, it doesn't take itself too seriously, even though, like, they're just so casual with the time jumping, it's kind of weird, but, like, uh, the art is really phenomenal, um, and the storytelling, it moves really well, it's a lot of fun. Well, yeah, it's very, to your point, Pete, it's very breezy. It feels yeah. like purposely like a big action spectacular or action TV show. Um, I know I said this the last episode where we talked about it, but it feels like Drive, the series with Nathan Fillion, which had a very similar tone to it, but no time travel. Um, great stuff. Definitely pick up this book. Star Trek Year 5, number 12 from IDW, written by Jackson Lansing and Colin Kelly, art by Kieran McCowan, Sylvia Cal. Fano and Stephen Thompson. Uh, if you hadn't picked up the last issue of this, this is essentially Space James Bond versus the crew of the Enterprise. Pete, I know you were super into this one. What'd you think? Yeah, this is fun. Uh, not usually that big of a Trekkie head. Sometimes I am, but uh, this is... Uh, by the way, is... that is what they call fans, Trekkie heads. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, um, I... I just think this is so so cool. I love the way that uh, they kind of bring the Star Trek characters that we know and love to life in this comic. It really feels like them, and uh, yeah, I just think it's uh, it's really kind of like they're even kind of breaking down Captain Kirk as the comic is going on, which is very interesting. I I love the action. I love the storytelling. The art's fantastic. This is a great great comic. You get a judo chop. You get a classic oh, judo chop come from on. your man, yeah. James T. Kirk. That's, really fun What more stuff. do you want? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> come on. <laughs> come on. Come on to Spider-Man <laughs> The Black Cat Strikes, number five from Marvel Comics, written by Dennis Hopeless Hallam, art by Luco Maresca. Uh, this is the final issue of this book, which takes place in the Marvel Gamerverse. It is a black cat who is back alive, Team it up with Spider-Man to take down this universe's version of Hammerhead. How do you feel this one wrapped up? Speaking of Spider-Man kisses, Justin, this one right here. Right How there. How do you feel about this, buddy? Just what you want. Well, and I, I will say, that's what I liked about this book, is the confrontation at the end between... It all sort of got pinned on uh, Black Cat and Mary Jane. Mm-hmm. Didn't see that coming, and I thought it was cool. Yeah, I think this is a fun Spider-Man book. I really liked it. I also really liked how it ended and who got to get the kiss. Uh, I was nervous about it the whole time of what's going on, especially because of the cover. But uh, I'm glad the cover, you know, sometimes you hate when the cover reveals an ending, you know. And so, uh, yeah, I was uh, very happy with how this ended. Well, you know what they say, you can't judge a book by its ending. Yeah, that's a good point. That's why I always flip to the ending and then I say, nope. 
<laughs> nope. I don't know what's happening because who are these characters? <laughs> <laughs> Nailbiter returns number two from Image Comics Story and Art by Joshua Williamson and uh, Mike Henderson. Now, this is, as you can imagine, the Nailbiter finally returning. He is a serial killer who bit his own nails and other people's nails off, which is real and gross. One of those so is gross. fine, and one of those is much more problematic. Yes. Is it fine? The big though? cliffhanger. Is it fine? At, it's not I don't like your nails. I don't. Yeah, yeah, you should. Gross. You shouldn't bite them. You should get them. Cl- you should cut them off. You know. What you mean? should get them clip professionally them. clipped. You should clip. What are you, Mister <laughs> High on the Hog over here? He's got his own nail clipper. <laughs> well, wow. I'm just saying, you like, get one haircut but, and all of a sudden it's manicures <laughs> all day long. That's not yeah. what I'm saying. Are you going to go get a pedicure? Is that what's uh, on the I'm docket just, for you? I'm just saying Ooh. you should. You shouldn't bite them. It's not good. <laughs> So the town of Buckaroo has some something weird about it where there are more strange serial killers that have popped up there than anywhere else. All of them seem to be coming back somehow. We don't know how. And that plan gets pulled off starting this issue. Meanwhile, the nail biter himself is being held in a prison underneath the town. So a, lot, a little bit of exposition, but a lot of stuff going on this issue. We love the first one. How do you think they followed up in number two? It's great. I like that they flipped sort of flipped the camera and we get a lot more of a uh, nail biter stuff here, sort of uh, that his perspective. And I mean, this is just clearly a story that has been well thought about and well planned. And I'm very excited to see the, the progress. Yeah, this is a, a fun story. The art is fantastic. Uh, loved uh, kind of like what happened in this issue, really setting things up, moving things forward to get you more excited about the series. And even the next issue preview image uh, is hysterical. This is just, it's twisted, but it's also fun. And the art is, is, is worth it alone. Ghostbusters Year One, number four from IDW, written by Eric Burnham and art by Dan Schoening. Now, as far as I can tell, I have not read the first three issues. This is taking place after the first movie. Yep. And then retelling things that happened in it, I think. Yep. Yeah, of. year year one is sort of a misnomer here. Right. Right? Uh, because I feel like we kind of already got the year one. That was the movie. the movie. That was the movie. Uh, but Pete, you're a big GB's fan. Goddamn right. Uh, yeah, this is great. Uh, you know, it's fun to see the people we know a little cartoonized a little bit, which is cool. Uh, they do a good job of, like, keeping who the characters are and still kind of making them fresh a little bit. And it's fun. You know, we got Egon uh, kind of explaining himself. And I like how he gets defensive, uh, you know, about the uh, containment unit exploding. And then the t- uh, the Twinkie call out was fantastic. Uh, yeah, this is this is a real kind of fun look at, uh, you know, Egon <laughs> and what kind of what he's. Uh, uh, and we also get a new Slimer story, which I was very excited about. Uh, Slimer, uh, one, everybody's favorite ghost. You know, we got a little new no. tale there, so this is great. Slimer, to me, Slimer's overrated. All we get is just this Whoa, go, little, little, he's a little specter. And he's fine, or he eats you. pizza, and it's like, all right, we get it. And hot Slimer's dogs, like, so good when he's, 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 hot dogs. Slimer's like um, a Saturday morning cartoon serial commercial where it's like, oh, he does the same thing. He's like Cookie Crook, he's Toucan Sam. That's what's I'll, I'll extend that to Why are you saying those things like it's bad? There's nothing wrong with Cookie Crisp or Toucan Sam. You gotta There's follow your nose. lots of things that are wrong with both of those things. I'll extend it to Ghostbusters as a whole, which I like the movie just fine. It's a pretty limited concept in execution. Like, every time I read a Ghostbusters thing, it feels like... They're not expanding the mythology at all. They're just retreading the same ground in slightly different ways, you know? Oh, and that's wow. so the writing they're here kind of is staying fine. in their lane and kind of uh, having fun with the characters we all know and love, is what you're saying. I guess if I wanted to watch the characters we all know and love, I'd just watch the movie, which has some great actors in it. Oh yes. Or are you saying you'd rather watch the original cartoon, the Ghostbusters, where those other random dudes got in a weird elevator? Yeah, yeah and... the, the real Ghostbusters. <laughs> yeah. I'm talking about the originals. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> they don't see. Where's the monkey, Pete? There's no monkey in here. Oh, stop. 
<laughs> this is wow. fun. You guys are assholes. Hawkeye Freefall number six from Marvel Comics, written by Matthew Rosenberg, art by Otto Schmidt. This is the last issue of this title, which has been a great run on Hawkeye as he's going head to head with the hood. Some big things happen at the end here. I don't know if they're going to stick long term, but I kind of hope they do. How do you feel about how this one wrapped up? Guys, this Rosenberg guy is a hell of a writer. Man, I wish we could get him on the show to talk to him. This dude is killing it. Uh, I, yeah, I really love what happens in this issue. Uh, it's really great job of like capturing the voice of Clint, and it really feels like an extension of that famous kind of like Matt Fraction run in such a great way, but also puts a little kind of new kind of stamp on it. I was really happy with all the twists and turns and the fun shit, and uh, this is a great, great comic. Um, yeah, I agree. The way it it lands, I thought was just so well done. Yeah. Um, yeah. With uh, I forget the exact line, but it's sort of like, "Don't worry, he'll be a villain soon," or something like that. I think it's uh, like he's one of us. Now. He's one of us now. Yeah, even if he doesn't yeah, he know does, it yet. Yeah, he's one of us now. He, he doesn't even know it yet. Like that. I think that what a great way. It feels like that was the point of the series, and they. Uh, they do such a good job of walking us there while telling a great story. Beautiful art, too. Great. Oh, yeah. yeah. Great book. All right. And the fun, it, I just want to say the fun, oh, yeah, like, Connor. costume changes that he does, which is really, really awesome. Good stuff across the board. If you want to support our podcast, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday at 7 p.m. to Crowdcast and YouTube. Come egg out. We would love to chat with you. iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe and listen to the show at comic book live to follow us socially. Comic book club live.com for this podcast and many more. And we'll see you next comic book week for our reviews of the goddamn The Virgin Bride. Uh, let's kick it off with issue number three. Pete, what did you think about this one? <laughs> what is happening? Stop this nightmare. You'd looper. You're being looped. Yeah, 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 yeah. Once a week, that blows your